here this evening for our annual Leo Swan Memorial Lecture. Leo died in 2001 and is fondly remembered in the Tala area as an encouraging teacher and former principal of Our Lady of Loretto Primary School. He was also a founder member of our historical society. While teaching, he was involved in archaeological investigations and in lecturing on archaeology. In the early 1990s, he gave up teaching to concentrate full time on this activity. He led the excavation at Temple Oak House where he discovered early Irish glass. From its beginning in 1995, Leo was a great friend of the County Library and in the historical, and in Tala historical, and we in Tala Historical joined with County Library to hold our annual, an annual lecture here in his memory. We hope that it is indeed a fitting tribute. We are delighted that Leo's wife Verity and other members of the Swan family are here with us this evening. Tonight's lecture will be given by Neil Jackman and I'm going to leave it to Dr. Rosalind Ward, a great friend of our society, to uh, take it from here and proceed with the introductions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. six, seven minutes, and then I'm going to hand over to uh, Neil Jackman, uh, the archaeologist who led the investigations over the Hellfire Club this year that most of you are familiar with at this stage, I, I think. Um, just to put some context to the study itself, um, the project was one of a number of archaeological uh, projects that has been undertaken under the um, South Dublin County Heritage Plan. I'm the County Heritage Officer and, and that's my Bible, that's what I work to, all the actions and objectives in that to raise the profile of the county's her heritage uh, are in that and raising the county's archaeological heritage was key element in that report or in that uh, document. So we undertook um, a number of archaeological uh, studies over the last number of years and the one that we're talking about tonight obviously is the Hellfire Club. Um, the action specifically, I suppose, that uh, this project relates to is this one, number 2.5, um, where we really aim to work in partnership with a lot of other people to get the information and to present it. And I suppose this is where the project has, uh, arose from uh, three years ago now, um, Neil, in that Neil came to me as a professional archaeologist with an interest in the Hellfire Club, and he came to meet me here in the council offices in Tala in 2014 and out of that then came a three-year project uh, I suppose the culmination of which you're going to see here tonight. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay I'll talk on. Um, I suppose that the main aims of this particular project with the Hellfire Club, oh I'm live as well, am I? <laughs> um, the main aims really are to um, identify, examine and interpret it, or, or interpret what is up there. Now, I think a lot of people are very familiar with the Hellfire Club building itself, <coughs> but very many people wouldn't have been aware that there are two archaeological monuments up there that we're aware of, and perhaps a lot more. Um, and that's what I think the results of this study are indicating to us. Um, it's the largest tomb in the Dublin Mountains and the Wicklow Mountains range. Um, so, does that add more significance to it, or is it telling us something different? And did it have a long habitation or use of habitation up there? These were all the questions, I suppose, Neil and myself were discussing as to what we were going to do up there. Um, we were hoping that we would get uh, enough material out of the study to get a radiocarbon date for the site because there are no radiocarbon dates for any of the sites in Dublin Mountains and there is very little recent um, archaeological work up there. So this was going to be breaking new ground, pardon the pun. Um, so we were hoping to get some evidence for a prehistoric inhabitation up there or a date for that. And also because more people are familiar with the building itself up there, the, the lodge, the hunting lodge, we wanted to get more information on that and to learn more about the story of the, um, the wicked goings on of the Hellfire Club group itself, uh, as we all know from our folklore. Um, uh, so it was really, I suppose, a whole awareness raising project. We were um, we know it's of architectural importance. The building itself uh, was built by William Connolly, who was the Speaker in the Irish House of Parliament back in 1725. He was the wealthiest man in Ireland at the time, uh, had loads of money. He owned Rathfarnham Castle and a huge area of Rathfarnham, and his own house uh, was <coughs> Castletown House in Kildare. 
So it was suspected that the Hellfire Club was slapped out in the middle of those two massive properties so he could you know, take time off and go up onto his hunting lodge and view his world beneath them. It's a great location uh, to do that and those of you who are up there will know, you know the view is spectacular. The remains of the building up there is today one of the best um, preserved um, 18th century, early 18th century houses that we have. Um, it didn't quite look like that obviously when it was built. Um, there were steps leading up to the upper floor and it was felt that that was where the, the primary habitation was. That's where um, it, the ground floor was where the servants were and the store was in the kitchen. And the um, William Connolly and his, his guests would have lived in that middle floor because there is a third upper floor as you see with the small window to the side, and that roof, or that ceiling is long gone. Um, what else uh, you're all familiar with, I suppose, the, the little um, steps here on the side of the, this flank of the building. Again, thought to be the little steps that the, uh, the horse rider would have stepped up on to mount the horse or to get down off the horse from. Um, there's been quite a lot of disturbance around the site, as you're all aware, um, and again, the story would have been that William Connolly um, instructed his, his team to, you know, take the stone from the tomb to build the, um, the building itself. And that's where, like, the tomb would originally have stood as a big cairn, so a lot of that stone, that material, was used for the building of the building itself. Um, which raises a lot of other potential projects into the future as to can we determine what stones in the building, you know, may have come from the tomb. Uh, and I suppose Neil might elaborate on, on some of that later on, uh, tantalise us all with the, the possibilities there. We know that the site is of significant historical and cultural importance, um, not just for the, the, the archaeological site, but also because it's what most people are familiar with when you mention the Hellfire Club. Um, as I said, the activities of the early 18th century uh, group um, who... Uh, the Hellfire Club was established in England early in the 18th century, and the Irish branch of it, I think, um, took residence in the house up there around about eight, or sorry, 1729. Uh, William Connolly died in 29, and I think they took the lease in 1735, I think. Um, so there was a period of when it wasn't really used, and they used to meet originally, apparently, in the Eagle Tavern in Cook Street, or Cork Street, in the middle of town, but they're, um, it's thought their outrageous behaviour. Um, it meant that they needed a little bit more privacy to do what they were doing. Uh, and I mean, there's a lot of debate about this as well, whether they actually were ever on the Hellfire Club, whether they ever were on Montpelier Hill, or again, stories that we're all aware of, the supernatural connotations of the devil appearing and uh, debaucherous activities on the site, whether any of that actually happened or not. Although again, there are a lot of stories in the folklore record, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, later on. Um, Dean Swift, who, who has connections obviously in Sagart, uh, described a brace of monsters, blasphemers and bacchanalians. So he wasn't too impressed with them. And uh, there is a suggestion that, okay, they were very, well, they were young, very, very wealthy, aristocratic young men uh, with nothing else to do with their time or their money than to you know, horrify people with their drinking and their, um, their challenge to institutionalise religions, let's put it that way. Um, so if that's what they were up to, they're just party animals, really, and they had the money. They had the money to do it, and they had the status to get away with it, which is the difference, I suppose. Um, then, from the archaeological side, um, there are three up there. Um, the Hellfire Club itself is an archaeological monument, and then you have the two tombs. You have the larger tomb here. You can you see the outline of that? And then the smaller tomb over here. And the you, you can when you're up on the site, you can just about see the the curve, let's say, of the rampart around the larger tomb. But the smaller tomb is very indistinct, and it's really only marked by the presence of the trigonometric pillar or point, which is we think slapped out in the middle of where the tomb was. Um, so it's a useful marker, but um, unfortunately, that smaller tomb seems to be quite disturbed. Although, as you'll see from what we're going to talk about tonight, even destroyed tombs like that can yield quite a lot of information. So in 2014, um, the first phase of this project was to look at the, those three themes, the archaeological theme, the um, architectural theme, and the cultural theme of the, the Hellfire Club group itself. And what we did was we undertook, um, it was a non-invasive study, we didn't do any digging or any excavation in the first year. 
We use LiDAR. You know what LiDAR is? It's a um, light detecting um, and ranging uh, survey method where laser beams are bounced from a, maybe um, an aircraft down onto the ground and that distance is measured. And if you do quite a lot of that in a small area, you can start to build up a lovely um, picture of what the ground is actually telling you. And it strips away all the vegetation from the view, so you're really getting a view of what's under the vegetation and on the surface. And that LiDAR, which was supplied to us um, from UCD, uh, Dr. Steve Davis, um, you can see the large tomb quite clearly, and the little tomb, the smaller tomb, and there's the outline of the building. So you can see where the building really encroached onto the site of the two tombs, um, taking some of it away, particularly from the, the larger one. As I say, we didn't do any digging the first year. Uh, we just uh, gathered the information that was out there um, and Neil did quite a lot of research putting together the information on the Hellfire Club activities, perhaps, and whatever archaeological information we could put together for, for the site. Neil then also organised to have a geophysical survey done at the site. Any of you who watch Time Team are well familiar with the, the geophys yes, yes. Uh, results from the site. And that again gives you a reading of what's under the surface with the different types of soils and rocks and maybe where there was a bank banked up and the soil gives you a different res response. Um, Neil could give you far more detailed, uh, understandable uh, explanations of that process than I can. It showed up really that there is a lot of activity on the Hellfire Club. You can just about see the outline of the two tombs there, the green one and the blue one. Um, and there's the dip, the dinge in the ground where the building is. But all around the site, there's quite a lot of activity. All of those features would indicate that there's probably a lot more archaeology up there than we previously thought. And this was just on the Hellfire Club site itself. We didn't go out into the trees or down the slope or anything like, like that. So on the, on the basis of this ge geophys, um, we picked four locations and uh, decided to go and do some test trenches in the second year. So that brings us to um, 2015, uh, the second year of the project, where we did some preliminary testing on those four trenches. And the second trench, trench number two, uh, was the one that really, I think, got the archaeologists quite excited and which then brought us to year three, where we decided to excavate that section of the tomb and to um, see what more we could find there. Yeah, so trench two was, or trench two was where the fun was. Um, so phase three, uh, any of you who got up to the site uh, in October um, would have got to look straight into these trenches. Two trenches were excavated at the end of the day. And I'll hand over to Neil to give you uh, the story on, on that. Um, but just to say that this project is funded under the Heritage Plan, um, which is a council-funded operation. So I do want to give thanks to the council for facilitating this. I think the information we're getting from this is very exciting and you know, can tell us a lot more about literally what's on our doorstep and then we've been able to tell to, to date. Just before I hand over to Neil, um, the other project we're running alongside of this is the Hellfire Club Folklore Study. As I say, we're all aware of you know, the, the stories and the ghosts and the devil and the burning cat and all those other stories that uh, go with the, the site up there. But back in 1991, uh, there was a young scientist exhibition project undertaken by three lads in Terranio College uh, called the Hellfire Club Equating History and Myth. And they were the first ones really to pull together the folklore stories. They actually went out and you know, stood in different shopping centres and schools and sports grounds and asked people what they knew about the Hellfire Club. And they collated all of those stories into one document. And what we're going to do now, that's what, 25 years ago? Um, we're going to redo that survey now. So we're partnering with um, Tallaght Community School, the transition year students there, and they're going to redo that survey. Uh, so they're going to go out and talk to people again and it would be very interesting because I mean 25 years has brought a lot of change in society as you're all aware and teenagers in particular are more used to going straight online and getting their information. So we'll do a little bit of that as well. We'll get them to do some uh, social media uh, surveys perhaps amongst their own peer group but get out and talk to people you know, of all ages and see what they say and hear, hear what their stories are. And that's an interesting cultural experiment to see 
Has it changed? Have we lost some of those stories? Or have they actually been embellished? As you know yourself, the story always grows in the telling. So the core of the story might be there, but there might be a lot more gory details. Or there might be less. So it's an interesting thing uh, to see where that brings us. Um, so at this stage, I'll shut up <laughs> and hand over to, to Neil, who will follow up with um, the details of the site itself. Thank you very much, Rosaline. And I just want to stress as well, actually, that um, all of this project is down to Rosaline's vision. Really, um, it's not often that you can go to a county council and say there's a phenomenal archaeological story to be found here and for them to turn around and say that's really, really exciting, we're really on board with it. So Rosaline and all the colleagues in the council have been brilliant throughout this project over the last few years. And I'd like to thank uh, Chile and the Library and the Historical Society for inviting me along this evening as well, um, because it's a particular honour uh, for me to be asked to deliver the Leo Swan uh, Memorial Lecture. Um, Leo has a fantastic legacy in Irish archaeology, and his aerial photography in particular has been something uh, very inspirational to me. Um, his photographs, as you can see at the Hellfire Club, um, they encouraged me to carry out um, a drone survey every day during the excavation. So Leo's had a really long legacy in Irish archaeology and the fact that a lot of his collection is online now and accessible where researchers can go and find it, I think is brilliant. I think that's quite recent, I think that's over yeah. this year. Um, and if you haven't had the chance to, to visit it yet, I really do recommend this. It's an incredible collection of photographs from all over the country. So, to begin with, and I hope you'll forgive me uh, or indulge me on this now, I thought I'd start with a story, why not? <coughs> evening, okay? um, and after all, archaeology is just a way of telling stories. It's a way of trying to create a tale from little fragments of the past. So 5,000 years ago, on a Thursday, <laughs> a lustry autumnal day, a community climbed a hill. Men, women and children. Many carried a stone from their own fields and many collected a stone along the way. Some of these people carried small clay pots and within the pots there were bones of loved ones and ancestors. At the top of the hill, awed by the stunning views over the low-lying forested lands and the sea, the people were buffeted by the gusting squally winds that drove cold rain into their faces. Under the guidance of the priests, a great monument was nearly finished. A growing mound of stone, shining white against the dark hill with sparkling quartz catching the rays of light. A dark passageway led deep into the mound and the priests had decorated these stones with powerful symbols. The passageway led to a cool and dry chamber with a stone roof. Inside here, the community placed the bones of the loved ones. For many of the community, this would be their only time that they would go inside the tomb. For this isn't the place for regular people. This is a place for priests and ancestors and spirits. But when they return to the work, clearing the forests and farming the fields, it will give them comfort to see the tomb high above them and to know that their ancestors are watching over them. So what I wanted to do with that, that little story really is to put the people back into it because I think, especially when you're looking at really ancient archaeology, when you're looking at a period of 5,000 years ago and you have all of these strange monuments, it's easy to forget that these were living and breathing people. Modern humans, the same as us, with the same kind of wants, emotions, needs, fears, but they just had a different toolkit to get through their daily life. So, as Rosalind said, and I won't spend too long talking about this because Rosalind, I think, gave a really good overview. Uh, the project's been going on for a number of years, and it began really in 2013 when I first visited the site, and that was my first visit to the Hellfire Club itself. Uh, I have an excuse for not going up there that often. I live down in Tipperary, so it was a bit of a drive back then. But um, I was writing an article for the journal.ie, who used to do a regular series about great heritage sites to go out and see. And this was a Halloween special, so I was including all the best, most spooky sites in the country and trying to tell a little bit of the real story when I could. So where else would you go? Only the Hellfire Club. So as I walked around the building, my eye kept getting drawn outside to this low grassy mound. And I knew it was archaeology. I knew it was a monument of some description. I didn't know, was it Bronze Age? Was it Neolithic? I didn't quite know exactly what it was, but I knew it was something. So when I went home, I visited the National Monuments website at archaeology.ie and this, if you're not familiar with it, is a brilliant free resource. You can find uh, an interactive map here and it has 
all uh, registered and known monuments, 150,000 plus of them. And there you can find more and more information about them. So when I visited the site, I saw that there was indeed the monuments marked, as Rosalind pointed out before. Um, and it, they were marked as a possible passage to. And this is how it was described by Geraldine Stout, who visited the site in 1993, that what survives today south of the Hellfire Club is a horseshoe-shaped embankment or mound with a hollowed interior open into the north-northeast. There's evidence for a recent fire in the interior. There are two stones visible along the perimeter to the southeast. To the east are traces of a second cairn, uh, about 18 metres in diameter. So, uh, Geraldine, I think, looked at the shape of this mount monument, looked at the fact that many of the other two uh, mountains in Dublin and Wicklow have these ancient passage tombs on, on them and put two and two together and thought this is likely to have the remains of the passage tomb. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> passage tombs themselves date to the Neolithic period, 5,000 years ago, the time of Ireland's first farmers. And generally what they are is an artificial mound of stone or earth um, and it covers a stone-lined passageway that led to a burial chamber. And inside that burial chamber, you might find the cremated remains of men, women, or children. Now, they generally date to around about 3,300 to 2,900 BC, around about 5,000 years old. There are a couple slightly earlier in Sligo or Caramore, but generally speaking, the bulk of them date to in and around this kind of period. Newgrange, of course, being the most famous example, especially at this time of year with the winter solstice and so on, and everyone will be going along to it. So, so um, <clears throat> there's at least 11 of these tombs in the Dublin Uplands, with uh, notable monuments on Montpellier Hill, of course, uh, <laughs> Sleeve Pool, Ballin Scorny Woods, as well, Seahan, uh, there's three up there at least, Two Rock, and uh, perhaps to Braddon as well, although when to Braddon was excavated in, I think, uh, the 1890s, they found a Bronze Age bowl in there. But that's not to say it's definitely a Bronze Age cairn instead, because these monuments continue to be important places, mm. sacred places, and people in the Bronze Age, in fact, over a thousand years after they were first used, go back and rebury people in them. The Mound of the Hostages on the Hill of Tara, for example, is a really good example of that. Started out like as a Neolithic passage tomb 5,000 years ago, and all the way up through the Bronze Age, and even into the early Iron Age, people were be being buried around it and in it as well. So, uh, all these tombs, um, a lot of them are intervisible with each other, you can see one from another, and it extends down into the Wicklow Mountains as well. So there's a similar arrangement at Loch Crew, Sleep uh, in the north of County Meath, uh, near Old Castle. Uh, this is Kern T, with a, you see a number of other smaller tombs around it as well. So quite often you get this clustering effect, that you'd have one tomb surrounded by small ones. The tombs at Carrakeel and Keshkoran in Sligo, which cover the Brickleaf Mountains, are the most similar ones to the Dublin and Wicklow uh, series. Um, again, there are a lot of them are intervisible with each other. You can see one from another, and they cover uh, several peaks throughout the region. Now, the highest of the Dublin <coughs> Mountains tombs is Seahan. And though you have at least three tombs, uh, including this uh, exposed burial chamber here, and to the right of it, where you can see the Ordnance Survey Pillar, that's sitting on top of a cairn which probably represents another large passage tomb there as well. Um, that's the highest in, in there, it's I think 650 metres above sea level. Uh, sea Finn in Wicklow, uh, which is part <coughs> of the series, is perhaps the best preserved and best known one of them. So you can see it's made of a mound of stone, um, and you have a stone line entrance here leading to a passageway and a burial chamber. Now, uh, the, the interesting thing about this is, Seafin, uh, has anybody visited Seafin? Yeah. At all? Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful site. The tomb at the Hellfire Club would have been substantially bigger than this. It's by far the biggest. This is roughly about 20 meters in diameter. I think the Hellfire, we might be looking, or coming in around 30, which puts it similar to some of the tombs at Lock Crew. So it's very, very big. If size mattered back then, <laughs> it's a big tomb. <laughs> um, now, the last passage tomb to be excavated in Ireland was in the mid-1990s by Professor Marissa Sullivan, and that was at Knock Row on the Kilkenny Tipperary border. The opportunity to excavate a passage tomb doesn't come along very often, so 
all the way through were like, really, they're going to say yes to this, this is fantastic, that we had the opportunity to go and longer dig it. Because the last tomb in the Dublin Wicklow Mountain series to be excavated was perhaps Sefer in 1931, when it was excavated by McAllister. Now, McAllister used pretty different techniques to what I did. He had a bit of a reputation for dynamite. Um, I'm not allowed to do that these days. Um, but also, more importantly than that, he was actually a very good archaeologist and his plans of Stephen and a lot of these other tombs are, are fantastic. But the important differences between 1931 and now is now we can do things like radiocarbon dating. Now we can do pollen analysis and different types of scientific analysis, all that feeds into it and, and gives you a much fuller picture than what could be done. So we thought, uh, when we were talking, uh, myself and Wilson were talking, that there was a real opportunity here to discover more about the story of these ancient monuments, not just the one at Montpellier Hill, at the Hellfire Club, but the whole uh, series of them in the Dublin and Wicklow Mountains. And if we can obtain material for radiocarbon dating these, then we'd be able to start comparing them to the other famous tombs, like in the Boyne Valley, uh, Newgrange and Nowth, um, or the tombs at Loch Crewe, or the tombs of Slag. Are the Dublin tombs um, contemporary with these? Are the Dublin tombs older than any of these, or are they more recent? But why would you go about building one of these massive tombs up on top of a mountain? It's quite the undertaking. Why would you do it? It doesn't make much sense. A lot of other cultures, like ours, for example, generally put their cemeteries near enough to where they're living so they can go and visit them every day. But it's because I think mountains are liminal spaces. Uh, in many cultures, the sky itself is considered uh, sacred. Some cultures, like those of the Altai Mountains in Siberia, or some ancient Mongolian or uh, Tibetan cultures, uh, used to do what we call sky burials. And that's where they take you up, leave your body on top of a mountain, and you're gradually taken away piece by piece by the birds to be borne off into the sky. Um, it doesn't sound very edifying these days, but you know. Um, and think of our current, more traditional um, Christian view of heaven. Where's heaven if you ask a child? Where do they point? Up. We always consider the sky as being somewhat heavenly in some sense. And the summits of these mountains are liminal spaces. They're a place not for daily life. Nobody lives right on top of the mountain as such. There are more of a, an abode of ancestors uh, or spirits. There are a place where our world connects with something different. And it's impossible to visit the Hellfire Club, and I'm sure many of you would agree who's been there, and not be blown away by the views from there. Not only can you see far distant mountain ranges on clear days, but you also have a clear view of the sea as well. And this is, I think, a really important factor because we must remember that the people who built these tombs were the seafaring people. They could sail. The, uh, uh, there are examples of these tombs, very similar decoration, very similar layout, very similar period, found on the west coast of Scotland, Anglesey, Brittany, and the Iberian Peninsula of Spain and Portugal. These are, to some extent, an Atlantic, but not Atlantean, culture, okay? There's a difference, Atlanteans, all ancient aliens, and all of that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that at all. Um, so, there might have been a more pragmatic reason as well about building a tomb up on top of a mountain like this, uh, a more practical reason, and that's that they could have been territorial markers. Just imagine sailing into Dublin Bay here thinking, oh, this looks like pretty good fertile land. This looks like a nice place I could settle. Um, and then you look up at the mountains and you see these enormous tombs. That would immediately tell you that there's already a big community here. There's already big tribes of people here. So perhaps we could trade with them or, you know, but we're certainly not going to just move in and take over here. Somebody already owns us. Unfortunately for our tomb, though, these beautiful views, they also attracted people in later history as well. Most importantly for our story, uh, William Connolly, as Rosalie mentioned, of Kildare, who decided it was the perfect place to build his hunting lodge. This is Castletown House, just outside of Selbridge, and... It's one of the most beautiful, I think, uh, period homes in Ireland. If anyone hasn't had the opportunity to go, it's uh, definitely worth a visit. So by the time he had the Hellfire Club, the hunting lodge, should we say, constructed in around 1725, he'd already become the most wealthy man in Britain or Ireland. 
Um, and, but unlike a lot of these other peers who were incredibly wealthy, he wasn't born into money. He made his money. Um, it was in the, he was a pretty ordinary lawyer from <coughs> Ballyshannon in Donegal. But in the aftermath of the Williamite Wars, he acted as the principal land agent and speculator. So what happened was all the land that was confiscated from the supporters of King James was then given to the supporters of King William. And they were largely generals from England, from Holland, Belgium, Germany, Denmark. They didn't want land in Ireland, so they sold it to Connolly for knockdown prices. Connolly then kept hold of it for a while and sold it on at hugely inflated fees. Sounds a bit similar to some of the stuff going on <laughs> these days, doesn't it? Like, well, things changed and all they say the same, eh? Um, his disruption of the two could have been a, a, a statement in a sense. Uh, because prior to this, a lot of people would have had a real superstition about damaging an ancient monument, you know. And even to this day, there's pishogs out there that you can't go knocking down a ring fort or the furries will get you. You know, the, some of those beliefs still exist. And in some ways, they protect more monuments than the National Monument <coughs> Acts do, and uh, legal cases. Um, but this time at Connolly, was the time of the Age of Enlightenment, a time when old beliefs made way for science, commerce, and industry. And his destruction of the tomb uh, might have shown that Connolly felt himself to be above these petty superstitions, uh, though perhaps his workers might have been a bit more uneasy about destroying a place <coughs> that clearly belonged to the other one. So it was built in the Palladian style in 1725, and it was perhaps designed by Edward Lovett Pierce, who was working on Castletown House at this time. He was a famous Palladian architect. Um, now, this was the front door, for those that don't know, don't mind me shaking hand. Uh, there would have been uh, granite steps leading up to it, uh, originally. And the building would have been plastered and whitewashed. It would have been visible from all over Dublin. A real statement, again, that I'm William Connolly, I own all of this, you know. Um, but Connolly himself, uh, you know, part of the, uh, I suppose, when he was having it constructed, we know from the folklore, the, the uh, workers destroyed these two ancient tombs, these huge stone monuments there, and they used all of the stone uh, to build the Hellfire Club itself. And this is where the connection between, I suppose, the supernatural and the ghost stories and all of that stuff, and the Hellfire Club really begins. The first bit of folklore we have about it was that a devil was so enraged with the destruction of the tomb that he blew the original roof off, and Connolly had to reconstruct it in that unusual barrel vaulted style. Um, but uh, Connolly didn't live too long to enjoy his new building. He died uh, just a few years after it was constructed in 1729. And then it was idle till roughly, we think about 1735, when it was said uh, there are links that it was leased <coughs> excuse me, uh, to Richard Parsons, the Earl of Ross. Uh, and he was one of the leading figures, uh, as Rosalind was saying, in the Dublin's Hellfire Club. Now they started with the Duke of Wharton in England, and in a strange coincidence, the land where the Hellfire Club was built, and Rathfarnham Castle, originally belonged to the Duke of Wharton. He had to sell it to William Connolly at a knockdown price, because he had huge gambling debts in England. So the guy who first started the Hellfire Club in England, it was his land where the later became so associated with the Dublin Hellfire Club. Um, so, Parsons was one of the leading figures. He's not actually shown in this painting by James Warsdale, who was the guy who came over from England to introduce the, the club to Ireland. Um, but he was infamous for obscenity, blasphemy, and his habit of receiving the guests, particularly clergy, in the nude. <laughs> he, and he, he, I suppose he, said, he definitely liked to shock and to make a bit of a racket. And now, uh, they used to drink down in the Eagle Tavern in Cork Street, and, you know, we don't have a direct link between Montpelier Hill and the Hellfire Club itself. Now, a lot of historians doubt it, but I think that somewhere in the Connolly Archive, hopefully, there might be a lease agreement between the Earl of Ross, or perhaps in the Earl of Ross's collection at Burr Castle, maybe he'd have something uh, that suggests that the land might have been leased to them. Because if this land uh, for the Hellfire Club was leased to the... Um, Earl of Ross, then it's likely that it would have formed a perfect party house, you know, with no neighbours to upset. And definitely would have fitted um, the kind of things that they like to get up to. So, uh, as a group, they didn't really have any clear political ambition beyond that of shocking people. They used to do black masses and so on. But I think 
those black masses and trying to conjure the devil. I don't think that came from a, a place of religion. I don't think it was like Alistair Crowley or uh, Arthur Conan Doyle to some extent who came along later in the 19th century who actually deeply believed in these things. I think they did it just to shock. Again, it's all part of this age of enlightenment. We're incredibly rich, we'll do what we like kind of attitude. Um, but they were pretty short-lived for all the noise they made and all the books that have been written about them. They were quite a short-lived organization because the Earl of Ross, who was the chief financier of them, if you like, he, he was the kind of epicenter of them. He basically drank himself to death by 1741 at quite a young age. And worse again, the Earl of Santry, this proud looking man here, um, he was arrested for murder. Apparently uh, there was a few, he's linked to a few murders, but there was one he committed in full view of everyone. He was drunk uh, while having dinner in Dublin. Uh, a waiter upset him, uh, so very reasonably of course, the Earl of Santry took out his sword and stabbed the waiter, killing him. Um, so he was arrested, he faced hanging, uh, but his family controlled the water supply to Dublin. And they very politely said, well, you can send him to exile instead, otherwise Dublin's going to go thirsty. So he had to disappear then and not return to Ireland. So he went to the colonies, as they say. And after that, and after the two richest, most powerful men went, the group kind of broke up. James Walsdale, who painted this, um, he went down to Limerick and he met a load of other aristocrats down there and they found a new Hellfire Club that appears at Askeaton. It's actually in the grounds of Askeaton Castle, they have a little house there. Um, and the hunting lodge was leased to Charles Cobb, the son of the Archbishop of Dublin, but he, uh, records say he died inside the Hellfire Club uh, in 1751, just two years after he leased it. And then the club itself slides back into dereliction. One of the most important, I'll have to have a before I start this, one of the most uh, important accounts of the Hellfire Club comes from the antiquarian Austin Cooper, who visited the site in 1779. <coughs> and he described <clears throat> on the top of Mo the hill of Montpelier stands a house built by the late Mr. Connolly. It is all arched and is now entirely out of repair. Upon the top of this hill formerly stood a kern, that's his spelling, not mine by the way, uh, which was removed to make way for the house. Behind the house are still the remains of the kern. The limits of it were composed of large stones set edgeways, which made a sort of wall or boundary of about 18 inches high, and with inside those with the small stones heaped up. It's 35 yards diameter, or 102 uh, yards in circumference. In the very centre is a large stone, uh, not raised upon other large stones, but lying low, with stones played away from about it. There are several other large stones lying upon the heap. About 60 yards southwest of this stands a single stone of about five feet, but whether it's part of this druidical remains, or only put up there for the cattle to scratch themselves, <laughs> the use of which it is now made of, I shall not positively say. What's really important about what uh, Austin Cooper is telling us there is he's visiting the site 54 years after the Hellfire Club was first constructed. And in that 54 years, it had already become uh, a complete ruin. But what he says here is we have the remains of the Kern. And the limits of it, composed of large stone set edgeway, sounds exactly like a curb, like you'd see at Newgrange. You know, the types generally covered in megalithic art. So that's still there after the Hellfire Club had been built. It, what it says is that they didn't completely erase the site to build the Hellfire Club, which gave me a lot of hope that what we have here underneath the grass, we might have some good remains left <coughs> in the monuments. Um, so we started to look at the site, and we started to look at a strategy of trying to uncover that. Now archaeology in itself, as I'm sure you're aware, is a destructive process. To understand something, essentially, we have to take it apart, and that way we can retrieve the date material, we can see how it's structurally put together. Um, but we didn't want, so we didn't want to do uh, a great deal of excavation there, because that could become quite destructive to any remains that are left. So we started to look at it in a phased approach, and we started to look at it using aerial photography. Uh, and here you can really see the size of the monument here, and the fact that it's actually bigger than the Hellfire Club itself, which gives you an idea of the scale. Uh, again, you can see that roll line ditch there that seems to mark the edge of it. You know, the second tomb is almost completely invisible without using LiDAR. Uh, the LiDAR that Rosalind showed before shows the two monuments very clearly. And we carried out geophysical survey as well. Um, 
which helped to define a little more of what we had. We carried out a small amount of test trenching. This trench here, we thought originally this could be um, an outer berm, an outer enclosure type feature. But based on the results of our excavation now, it might represent a little more disturbance. We actually retrieved the Bronze Age date from this material, which isn't massively surprising because many of these uh, passage tombs in the mountains often uh, become sacred spaces again in the Bronze Age, so future excavation might reveal a little bit more about that. <clears throat> so, for 2016, our main uh, challenges really were, could we Oops, uh, could we definitively say that what we have there are the remains of an Elith passage to? Or is it a quarry pit from the 18th century? Could, if it is a passage to, could we find any material that we could use for a radiocarbon date? Any bone or any charcoal from one of the construction layers of the two um, that then we'd be able to use it to compare it to all the other more famous passage tombs that we know of in um, now in places like that. So, we, in September we were given the licenses from the National Museum of Ireland and the National Monument Service to carry out the excavation and with everything in place we decided to excavate two trenches throughout the month of October. Now, originally the plan was that if this trench revealed that there was no real archaeology left or very, very little archaeology left, we were going to open a bigger area, a full one quarter of the tomb in the hopes that we would find some intact archaeology. But when we started to dig this trench, we realized very quickly that it did in fact, um, there was significant archaeological remains. So this is trench one. It's running north to south. The building's just here. And trench two, a shorter trench, was put in at the most disturbed part of the site. And the job of trench one was to understand what the mound is made of and whether it was archaeological material or not. And the job of trench two was to see is there any potential at the most disturbed, damaged part of the site to reveal archaeological remains still intact? So, trench one measured 15 metres by 2 metres, and as I say, the key aim was to establish the nature of the mound. Now, all of the excavation is carried out by hand, um, by an experienced team with some fantastic support from UCD as well, from volunteers from there as well. So, everything was used doing uh, desodded using spades, Mattocks, which are like broad-bladed picks uh, for the upper layers and shovels, and then everything by trowel. So it's quite a long process, I suppose. And we were exceedingly lucky that the weather was so kind to us throughout this October. And what we found in Trench 1 was that the mound actually represented a core of kern material, some of that stone that you saw at Seafin earlier, some of the stone mound. And we also found numerous layers of this grey soil and what that looks like it represents is sods of earth, the top sod that the tomb builders cut and piled at the base of the loose stone to stop it sliding backwards. This is the kern material that we found here, and it's still quite extensive. Uh, so it was largely made of local granite, but there was an awful lot of quartz in it as well. And quartz is often associated with these passage tombs too. It reflects the light particularly well. There's some controversy where you look at M.G. O'Kelly's reconstruction of quartz at Newgrange, for example, with the big white facade, whereas uh, George Organ believed it might have led more like a path. So you get some variance in the interpretation about how quartz was actually used. But quite often when you see tombs like Seafin, for example, or some of the other cairns up on top of the mountains, you see quartz in among all the other stones. So I think it was kind of formed part of the mound itself. You can, this is a view down when we removed the mound, and you can start to see these layers of grey soil here. Um, now, uh, this is a great photo by Stephen Duffy, and it shows this very grey material, and it looks for all the world like the kind of material you find next to a well or by a river. It's quite clay, it's quite claggy, and I think what it is, it's part of a, a chemical process in the soil. So it's up against the stone, and as the rainwater comes down, it hits the stone and it can't go through um, to the subsoil, the rain. So it's just sitting there on this layer of soil and gradually, over thousands of years, that soil is then turned into this very water-like kind of clay material. And it was in here that we found pieces of bone. We don't know whether human or animal yet, that's going to be part of the um, future work. Very small fragments of bone. We found charcoal, 
and we also found flint as well from when they were making stone tools on site. All of this given us really, really good clues that we're heading in the right direction for 5,000 years ago. Trench 2, we didn't want to fully resolve the trench. Trench 2 was more about did material actually survive here or not. This was, as you see, its proximity to the Hellfire Club. This was in the most damaged part. So this was more with a view to a long-term project, which we'll come to a bit later. Um, you can see up here that we've got tiny bits of the cone still intact and the archaeological deposits there. Um, so we did find in this trench that there was huge amounts of disturbance and destruction. And interestingly, we found huge pieces of um, plaster and mortar, which looked like it came from the outside of the Hellfire Club building. So this, a lot of this disturbance relates to a later period when the Hellfire Club itself was out of use. And we found a culprit for where all of this disturbance come from, and it's probably from the construction of the old military road which runs nearby to the site in between about 1801 and 1803. They were constructing it, and I think the Hellfire Club, uh, the tombs, uh, the remains of it, served as a handy uh, source of stone. Because sometime between... Uh, after 1779, somebody came up, removed a standing stone, they removed the curb, and they removed a number of other features. And we found, you see this huge stone here? That was originally sitting in a Neolithic pit, and the stone would have been stood upright. So we call an orthostat. It would have marked probably the back of the burial chamber. Here, in the front here, being the burial chamber. And what we found as we were excavating it, is that somebody had been trying to excavate it before us. We found a bigger pit around it, that went all the way down to the base, and at the base of it we found glass and little bits of pottery that definitely dates to the early 1800s. So I think there's a really good culprit there in the old military road. And we also found what looks like a ditch that surrounds the site, you might have noticed earlier on. Um, that effectively marks a robber trench, where somebody came along and very systematically dug out all of the curbstones, one after the other, and left this indentation all the way around, leaving only one or two curbstones. Uh, still left on site. So the tomb has had, in a sense, two deaths, in a way. First, in 1725, for the construction of the Hellfire Club. Secondly, <coughs> in about 1801, for the old military road. So the kind of artefact that we found was, as you'd imagine, for a place which has been, has so much activity over millennia, we found a good range of stuff. Most of it, the bulk of it, dating to more recent past. It's been a place for picnics and parties, uh, you know, bags of cans and everything else for a very, very long time. But we also found evidence of prehistoric activity as well with a number of pieces of flint. And that was mainly waste material from stone tools. So people were up there making tools. Uh, we also found some highly significant discoveries as well, which I'll come to now. So these are some of the artifacts that we found. These are pieces of flint. Uh, I'd say that's what, 1970s, 80s, side of honor. <laughs> and we found lots of this kind of thing. And these are people sitting around having picnics and everything else and enjoying themselves. You know, we found lots of cans, but we don't need to do a typology of Dutch gold or anything like that. Um, sometimes these modern finds can give you a nice little glimpse into somebody's day. And just below the topsoil, we found these two coins together. The, an Irish penny and half penny from 1939. And they were found side by side, just like you see them once we remove the grass. And I just had this real picture of a fella on a sunny day, he's after having a picnic and he's lying down on this nice comfortable mound, having a snooze, only for us to come along and find these pennies, you know, 60 years later. He probably had a bad day when he realised he'd lost them. One of the nicer finds from the more recent periods that we found, uh, again, in this great picture by Stephen, was the remains of this clay tobacco pipe. Now, they're quite common. Uh, from archaeological periods, generally from the late 1600s, but mainly around 1700s, 1800s. You often find them. Sometimes they can be uh, quite plain. Other times they might bear uh, a maker's mark or they might have a political slogan in some cases. This one is because it has, you see the claw? There's talons of the claw, so it's like it's holding the, uh, an egg with the pipe bowl being an egg, you see. Um, you can also see there's a maker's stamp here. I'm not sure, we're going to be researching this to find out exactly what factory made this and when. I really hope it comes from the time of the Hellfire Club though. Isn't it exactly the same kind of pipe that you'd imagine somebody <laughs> smoking while they're doing their diabolical deeds? <laughs> <laughs> 
But the really important artifacts that we found, uh, one of them is this polished stone axe here. Um, now that was found in Trench 2, in the most disturbed layer. Somebody, uh, when they were taken apart and plundering the site for stone, obviously not that old, and it's just a small stone to them, useless to them. They didn't look twice at it, and we uh, happily found it. And Stephen, who's with us now, is the guy who found it. <laughs> well, don't see it. Um, I'm not sure of the material yet. It could be uh, porphyry from Land Bay Island. Again, I'm going to get a, a, an expert to have a look at it. Um, or it could be from the stone axe factory at Teeth Bullia up mm -hmm. in County Antrim, I love. Uh, but what's really interesting about it is, look at the edge. Normally with these stone axes, if you find them in settlement context, there's quite a lot of damage along this edge. Because if you can imagine a small stone axe in a, a shaft of wood, you, they are actually quite sharp, they are quite good to take down a tree, but they do take a lot of damage to the edge. So you often see that work, and you often see repolishing and things like that. This, this is pristine, it's like it was um, never used. And I think it was made deliberately as an offering. And um, bear in mind, this is a pre-metal age. This was the equivalent of owning a brand new BMW. So for somebody to make an object like this, put those countless hours into it, or to pay somebody to do it, and for whatever barter system they had, shows that there was a great reverence to put on it. And what's also interesting about it was it was deliberately broken. It was broken in half, almost identical to one they found in the mound of the hostages, uh, the Hill of Tara. And what that suggests is that it could be a foreshadowing, really, of what we see more often in the Bronze Age, that quite often you see votive offerings of things like uh, swords, or weapons, and they're deliberately broken, they're either bent or snapped. And it's, we interpret that as if you kill the object in this world, it's usable in the next world. That was the belief, and some other cultures around the world kind of share that belief as well. So that could be the case here, 5,000 years ago, with this polished stone axe as well. One of the most important things that we found though, and the thing that really um, confirms what we have up there is megalithic art. And it's funny and it's extremely corny, uh, but it, sometimes it's like things um, want to be found in a way. If I would have done that excavation in the middle of summer in, with the big high flat sunlight that you get, there's no way on earth we would have saw this. We removed that stone. You can see, you see the very faintest of spirals yeah. Yeah. just here. That's what we first noticed. It was sitting next to the trench like that, like a number of other large stones. And it was just, we were walking past and we were looking at it going, oh, that, that cut there looks interesting. And then the light shifted slightly and it shows that that cut there is over the top of these ancient circles. This is where it was sitting, just at the grass surface, sticking out, being weathered constantly. You see all the black around it? This is where people have been lighting bonfires for generations. It's almost the perfect hollow for it, just in the tomb with, you know, you can imagine everyone sitting around, leaning up against the mound, there's a big fire in the middle, everyone's drinking cans and having a laugh. But the light in the fire is up against 5,000 year old art. Uh, Ken Williams of Shadows and Stone, who's one of the finest photographers for this kind of thing, did a lovely job of bringing it out, and you can see it much clearer now, can't you? Almost impossible to see it with the naked eye. An incredibly, um, Serendipity, I suppose, that we chose to put the trench in that exact place <coughs> at that time of the year to see it in that way. So that we caught it just on that morning, that it was a particularly sunny morning, it could have easily been. But why is megalithic art so important? You see it again there, there's concentric circles on this side the other. So it's a rare and highly significant discovery. And megalithic art effectively proves that the site is a Neolithic passage tomb. In Ireland, this type of megalithic art is not found in other contexts. You do get rock art and other types of art from different periods and so on, but this type of megalithic art doesn't come from any other context other than passage tombs. This is an example at Loch Crew. No, sorry, uh, uh, now you can see the concentric uh, circles there. And then if I can go back to that one. See the same kind of design. <coughs> it's still, even with this type of photographic technique, it's still very hard to see it. So we have it all laser scanned as well, and the results of that have been, uh, you know, it's been fully confirmed. So it's a really exciting discovery, and it makes you think, as Rosalie hinted before, if they took away a lot of those structural stones to use to build the Hellfire Club in the old military road, 
how much megalithic art is still in that dark building? And wouldn't it be great to uh, laser scan to perhaps see if we can uncover some of those stories to see if any of that could still be found today? So, the space I'm at now is what we call, uh, in a very creative way, post-excavation analysis. <laughs> okay. uh, so the main jobs that we have to do is radiocarbon dating. So throughout the excavation, we took a number of soil samples. And a lot of those contain things like charcoal or organic <coughs> remains. So we're going, at the moment we're sieving all of that and we're retrieving all the charcoal. And that's going to be sent off to a specialist to identify what the wood was. Um, that's important actually, because some tree species are better to radiocarbon date than others. Okay, if you find something like hazel, for example, yeah. hazel has quite a short life. So that way, it gives you a more radio accurate radiocarbon date that you know that the tree was cut down probably within a few years uh, of it starting to grow. Whereas an oak tree, for example, could be 500 years old by the time you go to burn it. So that's less useful if we find it. Uh, we're carrying out, uh, we're going to carry out pollen analysis as well, and what that will do is microscopic um, pieces of pollen trapped within the soil might be able to give us hints to what the local environment was like. Was it forested up there? What kind of crops were people growing nearby? What kind of plants were wildly growing nearby? We're going to have specialists look at all the different artifacts and prepare reports on them. And all of this will help to fuse any, uh, help to inform any future phases that we do up there. And for future phases, um, <clears throat> obviously this is all subject to the Cancer Council's agreement and permissions from the National Monument Service and the National Museum. But I certainly think there's even more exciting stories that we could tell up there. There's a lot more to be discovered. One of the things I'd love to do, based on the results of Trench 2 that was just here, at the lowest part of it. Now, we know for the old military road, and we know for the Hellfire Club, that they took away most of the big structural stones. So I'm not expecting to find a burial chamber intact, and I'm certainly not expecting to find the passageway intact. They were particularly large, flat stones, particularly useful for construction. But what we might find are the stone sockets, the pits that were dug 5,000 years ago, so those stones would stand on end. And if we can find lines of stone sockets, that might give us the orientation of the passageway. And that way we'll be able to see then, did it have a solstice alignment, like Newbridge? Was it lined up to a particular solstice in the area, either midwinter or venal equinox? Or was it aligned to, uh, an astronomically aligned to another object, um, stars for example, in the night sky? Did it align to a landscape feature like the sea or a distant tomb or another mountain? So there's big questions, I think, that we can find. And now that we know that at the very bottom layer, we've still got potential for finding archaeology, we've got an opportunity there, I think, to have a look. And also, because it's not on the big mound, it'd be less digging as well, so it's not so bad. <laughs> uh, at the same time that that's happening, the poor old damaged second tomb, I think, is worth a look too. I'd be really interested to see, is it, can we tell to any degree, is this a Neolithic passage tomb as well? Or is it a Bronze Age monument? Again, reuse of a sacred landscape. It'd be interesting if it is, if we find material in here, and we can date the two of them to see are they contemporary. Was one tomb for one class of people? Was another tomb for another class of people? Did they have hierarchical systems like that? These are questions which are really big, not just in terms of this particular site, but the big questions in Irish and, in fact, European archaeology generally as well. Now, throughout the excavation, we always try to um, run it as open as we can. And it's really great to see so many people who came up to visit us as we were digging. We wanted it in such a way that people could come along to the trench and say, oh, what do you find today, or what are you at? Uh, and that started very much with a trickle, uh, with people walking the dogs and, you know, people using the hill on a daily basis. And it's great to see uh, Frank, as he lives nearby, who's a regular visitor there as well. Um, but we also, uh, with Rosalie, got schools involved as well, and we had so many school visits, which was fantastic, and we showed them uh, the different techniques that we use in archaeology, how we go about recording a site, how we go about digging a site as well. They were actually very good, they found quite a few things. So, um, so that was really important to us. And because of the nature of the site, and because of the big stories that it has, between the 18th century debauchery and carry on of that, along with this incredible, uh, mysterious, prehistoric history, 
it caught the media's attention as well, and not just in Ireland, but also internationally as well. Um, and this started to bring a little bit of an avalanche of visitors for the last two weeks. It's like we welcomed hundreds every day uh, who came up to visit us to see what we were doing. Now, when you're working on an outreach excavation where you get lots and lots of people come and visit, and you, you know, it has a double-edged sword, but what's particularly nice is that I think that the stone with the megalithic art clearly spoke to um, the artist in a young boy who came to visit because we, we were midway through uh, with Ken actually surveying that stone, doing the photogrammetry and the 3D scanning. And uh, poor old Ken didn't have any lunch with him, so I brought him over to the van for two minutes to give him a sandwich. And I bought the water and I walked back over to find uh, this lovely house drawn right on it. Now, you know, no how to You can't actually see any of the art uh, whatsoever, you know, so the kid didn't know he was drawing on 5,000 year old art at all. Uh, but it was just, of all the stones, there was 10 other stones he could have picked. 10! <laughs> but not to worry, because we had our chief archaeologist, Baxter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> uh, and he helped to, uh, to clean it off. Uh, do you know, one of the, my favourite things about the dig, uh, to be honest, was uh, all the dogs that we got to meet, or hellhounds as we call them. Uh, these are some of my favourites, Izzy and Fluffy. Uh, there's Baxter keeping a very close eye. Uh, Baxter was actually very canny, he'd turn up at five minutes to lunch every day. Every day, yeah, half your lunch for the whole dig. Uh, and Sasha and Rocco, uh, always very helpful if we found any bones, they were always straight over to that one. Um, the excavation itself, I think, is one of the best experiences I've ever had, anyway, as an archaeologist. Just in terms of uh, what a real honour it was, and what a real pleasure it was to meet so many people. And everyone that came up to that place had their own story about it. It's an almost unique site. Uh, you said in the introduction that there were similar sites in different European countries that mm. were shaped the same and from the same period of time. Mm. How do you reckon that came about? Like, what's the communication, or how was that just coincidence? Or no, not at all. As, as I say, I think they're um, seafaring people. I think they, for example, I worked on a site in Sligo, not uh, not too far from Sligo town itself, but well within sight of Knocknarea, the famous Queen Maeve's tomb, and all of that. And that was a big Neolithic site. And one of the pits I found there had uh, a particular type of flint-like material uh, called pitchstone, and that only comes from the Orkney Islands. So we were able to prove, definitely, that in the Neolithic pe uh, period, people were trans traveling between the western coast of Ireland and the Orkneys. So these people were well able to handle rough seas. If you can do the North Sea, you can definitely do the Channel, and you can do um, down the coast. Uh, into Spain and Portugal. So these people were well able to trade, well able to move. I think sometimes uh, we think of people in the prehistoric past in particular and we sort of underestimate them. They think that they live quite shabby lives in little mud huts, you know, but they were able to do serious astronomical calculation if you look at Newgrange. They were able to build these entirely massive monuments that for a long time, for centuries, were the biggest monuments on earth, you know, before the pyramid builders and all those flash fellas down in Egypt started getting involved. <laughs> but they, they were hugely capable. And I think that's what we have. We have evidence there of trade and commerce and movement of ideas and people. It was a very Cunliffe who wrote the Atlantic people. That's right, yes. Paris, I'm not sure. I think it was Barry Cunliffe, yeah. And that, that, it's like, outside the books, outside the library. Well, there we go. And it's highly <laughs> recommended as well. You see, there's a lot of debate over a long time in Irish archaeology about the existence of Celts, for example, and ideas like that. But I think what we've got to look at is, instead of putting names like that on things, is just to increase our awareness, really, that these people were hugely capable and that travel and the exchange of ideas was enormously important. The whole idea from farming, let's not forget, came from Iran, Syria, Iraq, and has come all the way over to the west coast of Ireland, you know. So it's, it's an incredibly um, innovative time. The inception of farming as an idea, the technology of farming, the idea to change, to start doing farming, that's the big, biggest single change in all of human history. It really is. Because without farming, people don't settle. Without settlements, they don't turn to towns, they don't turn to cities, they don't turn to states, they don't turn to countries. That decision to start farming changed forever. Humanity is destiny on this planet. And I think that these are the very people that we're talking about when we're talking about these ancient tombs. 
approaching. Did you want to ask? No. Okay. Oh, okay. Any other questions? That point you just made about the um, farming. Mm. There's a program on television recently, mm. 10 things you should know. Mm. It's something to catch, catch it. And it turned out that the, the original, don't forget about the Celts, they said, look at the farmers yeah. that came from Asia. But he also said, horsemen from Russia. Yeah. And they proven that, um, I don't know what the, the medical word is, but you know, the amount of Irish people have high, uh, uh, high iron in their blood. Mm. They reckon that's come from. The Russian yeah. horsemen, and this proves that we're more Russian horsemen than we are Celts. Yeah. <laughs> Celts I just thought it was brilliant. Yeah, but well, it's true. I mean, what it, it's a really, really complex story because we've just got swirls of people. I think in the past it was quite a simplistic story that the identity of the Celts, for example, was pretty much we're not English, and that's fair enough, you know. Um, but in fact, it's a much bigger story because we've got Middle Eastern roots. And what's really exciting that's started in the last 10 years is uh, DNA and analysis of DNA where we can find uh, the problem with these passage tombs is it's often cremated uh, bones and it's harder to extract DNA from. But in some cases, I believe there was one, uh, is it in Antrim in Northern Ireland? Um, Rathlin Island. Rathlin Island. Uh, wasn't it Middle East? Yeah. Yep. The steps. Yeah. So, you know, we're seeing that in the far distant prehistoric past that we've got people from unbelievably long distances away living in Ireland, sharing ideas, um, changing technology, changing life, really. So, yeah, the movement of people, I think, in these periods cannot be underestimated. Absolutely. Any other questions? Thanks once again, Neil. Uh, brilliant lecture, and I think you've, you've paid great honour and tribute to Leo Swan. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.